then uh, you definitely don't get your cotton here from Ireland. It's impossible to make it here. So it is being grown in other places like Turkey, uh, Pakistan, India, Central Asia. And there are all sorts of problems behind it. I will show you that in a minute. If you think about meat, of course, even the meat uh, that you eat here, not all comes from here. I mean, the sheep, yeah, the sheep, they, uh, you can easily see it. They are uh, kind of eating here and, and, and they use water, but it's on local, all local water. But there's a lot of import of meat as well. And, and this imported meat often depends on uh, imported soybean from uh, countries like uh, Argentina and Brazil. So that's the, soy, the soybean over there. If you look at what are the most important countries where Ireland does have an, an external water footprint, they are listed here and, and ranked. So the first one is the UK, that sounds like obvious. But then next one is the USA, and why? Because import of, of soybean, industrial, uh, industrial products, animal products, etc., etc. So you see uh, strange countries like Ghana. Why Ghana? Because you like chocolate. Uh, why Brazil, Argentina? It's, it's because of that soybean. Why China? Because of industri cheap industrial products. A lot of pollution behind it, as you know, uh, etc. Et so here, this is another picture, this is not the Irish uh, water footprint, this is the water footprint of all people together. So the water footprint of humanity, nicely put on the map. You see that there are places where there's hardly any water use, there are no farmers, there's no people living there. So there, the, the, the production is, of the agriculture production, industrial production is concentrated in a number of places. And of course you need to look at how this water footprint uh, leads to local problems. So you have to put the water footprint in a catchment in the context of the water availability. We have done that here in this research where we compare water footprint and water availability. In fact, we divide the two water footprint divided by water availability. If that goes beyond 100%, obviously it's unsustainable. Now, here it shows when it is unsustainable, how many months a year, and what we found is that about half of the river basins there is at least one month or more uh, a water footprint beyond uh, the availability. That means beyond the carrying capacity of the basin. So about 2.7 uh, billion people in the world are living in those, in those river basins with water scarcity, which goes beyond the carrying capacity of, of those catchments. If you look where that is, uh, now it's in many places obviously, it's not only in developing countries or so, uh, it's also in, in developed countries like in Australia and in the Midwest of the of USA, but obviously also in countries in, in, in northern and southern Africa and, and the Middle East. So, if you want to kind of visualize those those uh, red areas on the map, then you see this kind of uh, of, of problems. This is the the Aral Sea. Uh, basin or the, uh, the former RLC, I must say. The RLC uh, in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan is a sea that is uh, very quickly uh, disappearing because uh, the farmers around they use the water from two rivers, the Amudaya, the Serdaya, to irrigate their cotton fields. So these cotton fields uh, they get the water and the water evaporates. The water from the river doesn't flow into the sea anymore and the sea slowly. Um, uh, evaporates so it, it disappears. So you can see how humanity is able to quickly make a lake disappear. You see here it's only 20 years, uh, uh, only one third is left uh, and the projections are that it will just continue like that, at least if things are business as usual. And uh, the issue is of course not only uh, poor Uzbek people, because yes it's not good for the Uzbeki uh, kind of uh, economy, not for the fishermen, even not for the cotton farmers, because uh, the, cotton, uh, the cotton fields get, get silted, so they cannot continue this forever. So it may take 10, 20 years more, and the economy will be disrupted because of this. But of course, it will also mean that the importing countries that depend on this cotton will not get the cotton anymore. And cotton is a, is a this is just one example. You see many other places where cotton comes from have the same, same process. So it's not sustainable also not for the importing countries that depend on it. 
If we talk about nicer things like flowers, we see the same thing. The flowers, even the Dutch flowers, for your information, do not, do not come often from the Netherlands. They come from uh, other places like uh, Peru, like uh, Colombia, like Ethiopia, Kenya, etc. And this is uh, Lake Kenya, Lake Naivasha. It's a famous, uh, famous area for flowers. A lot of flowers being uh, produced for import, uh, for export to, to the Netherlands. From the Netherlands, they are again spread over Europe, um, and it takes a lot of water to, to, to grow those flowers. The lake slowly goes down, so again, it's not sustainable. The good story, by the way, is that all those cases where I talk about not sustainability, it's kind of a stupidity. It's just, it happens, but it doesn't need to happen. So the flowers here, we have been there, they use too much water, so they can do with less. So it's not only, uh, I'm talking about problems now, but there are solutions. I will come later to that, but let me introduce them already to you now. Uh, the, the, the problem is that we don't value water. So, and water is for free, it's a public resource. So there we uh, get into the problem. It's free, it's public, so there is no, no incentive for efficient use. So it is overexploited and for free. So that is kind of the underlying mechanism that causes those kind of things. And there is technology available to improve. However, the technology will cost something, even though it's not that costly, it will cost something. So it needs investment. So if there is no incentive, it will not happen and it doesn't happen. Uh, if we think about different sorts of food, then we see different sorts of water intensities. Here you nicely see them listed. Uh, and what you see is that uh, things like uh, pork and, and, and beef, they are relatively water intensive. So the animal products are relatively intensive. What you see is that the, the world population is growing. But what you also see is that economies are changing and improving and diets are, are, are changing. Particularly in China and India, you see people uh, moving towards a more uh, meat uh, and also milk uh, intensive diet. So you see that the, the future water scenarios show an increasing demand for water, an increasing water footprint, not only because of the growing populations, but also because of the growing economies and changing diets. So your favorite hamburger will cost about 2,400 liters. So think about it if you, if you, if you eat it again. Again here, it's not because I want to convey now a message anti-hamburger or so. It's awareness and at the same time it's also that not the one hamburger is equal to the other one. So it would be useful if people know the differences between the different pieces of, of beef. And, and we don't know because there is no information, no knowledge, no tracing of information, no mechanisms in the European Union or whatsoever. To, to, to kind of account for the fact that there are differences in water demands between one piece of beef and another piece of beef, or one shirt of cotton and another cotton shirt. And that would be useful, of course, that you know, okay, this cotton shirt uses half the amount of the global average, while another one may use two or three times more. So let me show um, <laughs> what it means if, if you compare different diets. You see here, uh, the, the kind of average diet in a Western country. Uh, you see here, check it. Here, about 950 kilocalories per day come from animal origin, much more, 2450 come from vegetable origin. So, in average, we have an intake of 3400 kilocalories calori per day. Not, not intake, that I say it wrongly, because you would get too fat. It's, it's what we consume, that means we buy it, so a lot we throw away. But anyway, this is what we, what we buy, and the water footprint, the liter per kilocalorie, is five times higher for those commodities from animal origin. So that means that if you look at the water footprint, 3,600 liter per day related to our food, most of it is related to the, the food from animal origin. If you then take... Uh, a vegetarian diet is still the same consumption, so we still waste. However, now we 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 take we waste more uh, vegetable origin food. Uh, 
you will see that our water footprint gets reduced from 3,600 to 2,300. So it's a reduction about uh, one one third by just changing your 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 consumption pattern. You also immediately will understand that these things are very sensitive to talk about. However, what I often say is why why not simply fire all the water ministers of the world? Why why because what does the water minister do? Try to kind of solve end of pipe some water problems? Well, in fact, what really matters for the water scarcity in the world is what, uh, what people do in terms of what they consume. So if you can ch- influence that, you're much more effective than, than having a water policy. If, if you can influence the, somehow to, to the, 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 the Minister of Economics or the Minister of Trade in a way that contributes to wise water governance, so that you have economic patterns that account for water scarcity patterns, then you would do very good. So, in fact, the, the story is about integrating water wisdom into decisions in other sectors, not so much better water policy. Of course, water policy, we need water policy, we need, we need water standards, etc. But what you need, what we really need, is to have an understanding in other waters, in other sectors, economic, trade, foreign aid, uh, agriculture, energy, on what means the policies in the other sectors for water. Because if in the other sectors you make decisions that integrate water with them, you will have a much better uh, governance of water. I come back to, to governance uh, from governmental point of view in a minute. What we see is that uh, companies, they understand water and water scarcity more and more. Because water, uh, because companies, they often don't use water so much water themselves, but they depend on ingredients that use so much water. So the Coca-Cola company, for instance, is the larger sugar buyer in the world. And sugar is a, a big water user one of the biggest water use. So, and, and there's a big difference between sugar cane and sugar beet. And you can also make sugar from, from maize. So it's good to know what is the water intensity of sugar if you get it from maize versus sugar beet versus sugar cane. What is the impact if you get it from here or from there? So a company like Coca-Cola is now looking at their water footprint of their kind of different products to see uh, to which extent their products are sustainable. Of course, they have now discovered they are not sustainable because they get the sugar cane often, and the sugar cane is very water intensive if compared to the sugar beet or the maize. And they get it from areas that are highly water scarce and where the sugar contributes to water, uh, over-exploitation of water resources. With this knowledge, of course, they can improve. They can set strategies for water footprint reduction. I was also mentioning energy, what has energy to do with water. What you see in European policy, but you see it also in the US, in Brazil, in China, in India, and all over the world, is a movement away from fossil fuels toward biofuels. It makes sense because biofuels are less carbon intensive. However, it doesn't make sense at all if you look at the water implications of that. If you really look at how much water it will cost, if you implement those policies worldwide, just 10%, you get an incredible increase of water demand and water footprint. So you only enlarge the problems you already have in the water sector. So the energy sector solves its energy problem by creating a water problem. That's not what we need. What we need is solving our energy problems and our water problems at the same time. The water, problem, water sector does do the same thing. They solve their water problem by, for instance, desalination. Now, what is desalination? It makes fresh water from salt water. So what is more wise than that? Because the issue is fresh water scarcity. So now you create new fresh water from salt, salt water. So that seems like wise. However, it's very energy intensive. So what you see in the water sector, they solve the water problems by making the water sector more energy intensive, more joules per cubic meter, while the energy sector is solving its problems by becoming more water intensive. Of course, again here, we need to integrate water policies, energy policies, in a way that solves all the problems at the same time. And here it shows the pro- the, the, kind of the numbers behind. It also shows that if you choose for, for biofuels, it makes sense that you look at different sorts of crops. Like 
in, in Europe we see a lot of focus on rapeseed. Let me, it does work. Rapeseed is there on the right side. Rapeseed can be used for making biodiesel. It's a very unwise choice to, to produce to, to produce biodiesel, a biofuel from rapeseed, simply because the water implication and the land implications are much bigger than if you would choose for sugar beet, which is just a proper alternative choice. But if you never look at these implications, the choice is made on other grounds. I've never discovered why, why there is not a discussion about if we make, first of all, whether we should make that many biofuels and whether it's really wise. But second, if you do it, then what sorts of crops you, you use for it? What are the implications for other sectors? Again, of course, water is for free, uh, etc. There are lots of subsidies in this, in this sector, so then, then it is possible, but not sustainable. This is, is a bit complex, but it shows a lot in, in, one, uh, in one graph. It shows the water footprint per capita for different countries. So you see on the left country a low water footprint per capita, and on the right countries with a large water footprint per capita. And on the right you see countries like the US and Southern European countries, and at the left you see China and India. And in the middle, somewhere in the middle, you see UK, uh, and also uh, Ireland is in that uh, in that in that region. So what you see is that the, uh, the water footprint is very different per country. The global average is about 1400 cubic meter per capita per year. And you cannot really imagine easily that the, the global average water footprint should go up. I mean, if it goes up, then it only you will see enlargement of the water problems in the places where already the water is used unsustainably. So the, wa the, the water footprint as a global total should go down in fact. But, but let's, let's assume that, that we are sustainable. If we just keep it at the same level as it is, then you immediately see that if China and India grow, other countries need to go down. So countries like the US, which have a water footprint twice the global average, it's not sustainable. What you see here is, is that it's not sustainable, it's not equitable. And uh, what you also see is that it's our particular commodities that contribute to the water footprint, and I already mentioned the, the, the animal products and the cotton. So we may need to think about global water footprint targets in the same way as we are now used to think in terms of carbon footprint reduction targets. Then we get this problem, as we have seen it for carbon as well, uh, that countries with a big carbon footprint like the US, they will not like the idea because well, water is the same thing for them. Uh, they need to reduce most because they have the biggest. However, they will probably find arguments that it's somehow not right that they should reduce, but they will probably argue that others should not increase or so. I don't know. So you will have a political debate here, which may be as uh, fierce as you have in, in the case of carbon. Nevertheless, I, in my new book, I introduced the idea of maybe a need for a Kyoto Protocol on water. Of course, we should not copy the mistakes as we have made then to water, so there is a lot more to say about that. Um, looking at Europe, I think it's interesting to know that we have a very specific position in all this. Uh, Europe is the largest, what I call, virtual water importer. So, you see different colors here. Uh, the green countries are the countries that use a lot of water for export. So they have a net virtual water export, as I call it. The red countries, they have a big virtual water import. So they rely particularly on the import of water intensive commodities. Now Europe is dark red. So Europe is the largest virtual water importer in the world. And that's a bit strange because Europe is not the most scarce area in the world or so. So why Europe, being not the most scarce in the area in the world, imports most of the water in virtual form? You can expect that for North Africa, the Middle East, because they will have to. For Europe, it's not so natural. The reason, of course, is that we do import cheap food. So there are other reasons and water why it happens. But if you look into the future, it will not remain. Australia, US are dark green. It means they use a lot of water for export. 
and they are overexploiting their water resources. So rivers get empty like the Colorado, uh, groundwater levels go down like in the mid Midwest of the US. So it is not going to, to stay like that. So these countries will in the, in the, in the future have reduced export flows of water intensive commodities. Um, but also India and China. India and China currently exporting water in visual form. They will become red countries because they are, have growing populations, changing diets. So already today you see them switching towards importers rather than exporters. 40% of the water for the winter of Europe is outside. So if you look in, in the future, you think about water scarcity, and you think in terms of virtual water import or export, then we should understand that the future will not be like today. What we will see is that countries like Australia, USA, that currently are exporters and currently have already quite some water scarcity, they will become more water scarce and they will export less water intensive goods. So they will move in this graph. China and India experience much higher water scarcity already, are still water exporters. They will become water importers. You see that here. The real scarce areas like Mexico, North and South Africa, the Middle East and Southern Europe, they are highly scarce. They already depend on imports and they will become more dependent on exports. Like yeah, you have areas in this world that depend on oil imports. There are country, countries that already depend and even well, more strongly depend on imports of water in virtual form. And then yeah, what is left, we have uh, North Europe and, and South America. These are the regions that have water still left. So those are the ones, those are the regions that in the, in the future will have to increasingly supply uh, water intensive goods to those areas in the world that have lack of water. So for Northern Europe, yeah, including Ireland, uh, including also my own country, the Netherlands, uh, currently big importers of water, there is an opportunity to reduce that uh, import and even maybe export uh, water intensive commodities. So what we ca can we do in technical terms? Uh, we can talk about zero water footprint in industries. It means, uh, in fact, zero water footprint does not mean zero water use. It just means you take the water and you bring it back to the system. So it means recycling. Or you take it and you also clean it. So a zero, uh, what we call gray water footprint, means no pollution. Zero blue water footprint means no, uh, no consumptive use. So you bring it back. If you look at the industry, then we should think about uh, using our rainwater more efficiently. Because normally we think about water <coughs> problems, we think about water scarce areas with over exploitation. And people are inclined to say then we need to use the water efficiently there, more efficiently. However, there are water abundant regions where the water is not used very efficiently. So if we make the water more productive in the water abundant areas, the rainwater more, then we have the production there where it should be in the rainwater uh, areas, in the in rain-fed agriculture. Fields. So we need to use our rainwater more productively and at the same time, of course, reduce the uh, efficient use of uh, irrigation water in what is called areas. And we should better think about how to use precision farming, organic farming to reduce the pollution also from agriculture. So sometimes I, I use this slide to, to speak about what I think are the most important things in terms of water allocation. First is we need to think about sustainability. That means a water footprint cap per river basin. So this is a, an instrument that governments can use. There is no government in the world that actually does use it. So it's an advice worldwide to introduce water footprint caps per river basin, that simply means that if there is no more water than there is, don't use more than that. It's a simple advice, but there is no government in the world that does do that. So that ex immediately explains over exploitation. If there is not a maximum to use and it is free, then it will automatically happen if the demand increases. 
it's not completely true that it doesn't exist. The Murray Darling Basin in Australia, there is a water, water footprint cap. However, they only apply it for surface water. So what you see is that people immediately move to groundwater. So they have switched the problem from one field to another field. So they can improve in that respect. So that is the first pillar, water uh, sustainability. The second one is efficient water use. So this is particularly interesting for companies that have products uh, and, and, and if they realize how much water it costs per pro pro unit of product and if they also realize what they actually can do to reduce that water footprint per unit, then they have a kind of incentive to, to work towards that. So that, that should be an other instrument, but also governments can kind of help in this because there needs to be regulation in, in terms of transparency, for instance. If, if there is no reason for, for being transparent, if there is no shared definitions of water footprint, it will be very difficult to communicate about efficiency. And the last one is the most difficult one. It's the social equity issue. Uh, some countries have a much bigger water footprint per capita than others, so we need to talk about sharing water, not only among communities within countries, but also internationally. So, finally, I would like to invite you to go to the website of the Water Footprint Network, um, <coughs> www.waterfootprint.org, and you will find there a lot of interesting materials and publications free for download, but also a place where you can calculate your own water footprint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very well.